And um, please uh, stay muted um, until after the talks, unless we tell you otherwise um, in the Q&A, um, depending on how many people join. Of okay, we are like 40-ish, so maybe it would be good if you raise your hand. You can do that um, by going to participants and then it's somewhere there, right? I always forget how I can do that. Okay. Um, maybe someone can, Alex, do you know how to do that? Ah, you have, you go on your profile picture, right? Ah, yes. Um, uh, Teilnehmer. Teilnehmer. And then um, you already see the hand, at least for me. Ah, okay, good. Yeah. But you can also um, post your question in the chat, of course. Um, and slides will be published after the event. Uh, alongside some resources for you, uh, all the links that we have in the presentation will be collected in a separate document. Um, yeah. So what's on the agenda today? First, uh, I will give a little bit of introduction. That's already what I'm doing right now. Um, and uh, I, then we'll have three talks um, on automation, broadly speaking. Um, we have Alex will talk about automated API querying. We have Yannick, uh, who will speak about automated reporting, and I will talk about automating data collection for Correlate, a personal evolution from Raspberry Pi to AWS. And then we have uh, hopefully enough time for good Q&A and some discussion. And uh, yeah, um, I totally forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Fri. Um, I work for Correlate as the COO. And yeah, I organized this meetup uh, together with some volunteers and yeah I'm really happy uh, that uh, you're all here. Okay and um, just two words about Correlate because I don't know whether everyone is familiar with us. So we are a German network of over 1,300 data scientists who want to make the world a better place using data science and um, what we do is that uh, we have three pillars in our work. So we have our data for good projects. We have um, where we connect uh, data science volunteers with nonprofit organizations who need help with the data challenges. And those projects are also pro bono, so they don't uh, cost the organization anything. Um, we have an education pillar where we are also right in right now. So this uh, open online data meetup is like part of our educational offering where we um, want to connect um, data scientists and offer them opportunities to learn new things and to exchange. But yeah, we also um, provide educational um, opportunities for nonprofit organizations to learn more about data science. And the third thing that we do is that we want to initiate a dialogue about the potential of data science for the social good. About the Open Online Data Meetup, it's a series that we started back in June, I think. So this is the fourth um, installment and it's an open format. So it's pretty flexible. It should just be about data basically. And it uh, could also be a panel discussion, a presentation, a watch party. Yeah, and we have, do, we have been doing this once a month, but yeah, if we have a lot of ideas coming in, I'm also open to doing this uh, more often. So if you have an idea, you can always write to events at correlate.org and uh, I can see what I can do. And uh, yeah, it's uh, supposed to be less than one hour long so that it's not a super long um, uh, thing. Okay, and uh, that's it, I think, from um, the introduction, and then we can start with the talks, and I will hand over to Alex. I will have to stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll first try to share <clears throat> and see if that works. Okay. Now you should see something. Yes. Okay, hi, I'm Alexandra. I am a part of the uh, Berlin local chapter uh, from Correlate. I've been with Correlate for the past, I don't know, two or three years or so. Um, 
next to my uh, volunteer work at Correlate, I uh, work as a data analyst at the uh, Mobility Institute Berlin. And uh, yeah, uh, the project I'm presenting today uh, uh, also about a kind of mobility project um, that was uh, still at my former um, employee, the Technologie Stiftung Berlin. Um, and what I will talk about is uh, how to store thousands of shared bike locations every four minutes into a, a database. Um, first of all, the last time uh, I had some mic issues, um, so everybody was too polite to say that it may, makes weird noises. So in case there are any weird noises again, <laughs> let me know for you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I said, the project had been... Um, I think I have to. Yeah, that works. Uh, was at my last employee, so it's already uh, like about a year ago that I had been doing this. Um, so, yeah, I hope I can still get all the details uh, together. But uh, about the background. Um, so, uh, sorry, I need to close the window so I can see my slide. Um, yeah, uh, the background. Um, they are the shared bike providers, like for example, Nextbike or uh, Jump or Needlebike, and they have uh, openly accessible APIs with information on their current bike locations. Um, so an API, um, for those who don't know, is a application programming interface. Um, that uh, basically means um, an open um, uh, yeah, interface where you can actually, uh, where, you, where you can access uh, the data from the data providers. So uh, here on this little screenshot, you can see, for example, um, the different bike providers uh, where they share the location of the current bike, but it's only the current location, it's not historical data. But this data you can retrieve via um, the APIs that they're um, giving. So the idea we had was, um, well, if we would not only have um, the data for the current moment, but if we would have like continuously stored um, data, then you could do analyses on the movements and, uh, for example, determine bike hotspots or um, where people, where the um, like largest areas people move from uh, A to B, um, and and that alike. But yeah, in order to have that, you need to have historical data and you need to store them continuously. So. Um, yeah, what I would like to present you now is how we went about uh, getting that data and storing that data and how to automate that. So the setup uh, that we used was, um, first of all, an uh, external server. Um, so the script does not have to run continuously on your laptop uh, because you don't want to have your laptop doing all the querying all the time and have it on 24 seven. Uh, yeah, I used uh, Uberspace for that. Um, you can be any server um, where you can yeah, run scripts on. And then on that server, you, you put that Python script in this case um, that actually runs the code um, where you query the bike locations and where you store them into a database. So from that Python script, you do the API call. In this case, we did the, um, we, or we queried the APIs of Mobike, Nextbike, and uh, Crawlerbike, uh, also Needlebike. Um, in Berlin. And um, yeah, the problem here again is the script now sits on your server, but you don't want to be there clicking, run the script, run the script, run the, run the script all the time. But you also want to, of course, uh, automate uh, that the script is run um, automatically. So the way you do that um, is by a so-called cron job. And this makes the Python, Python script run, in our case, every four minutes. Uh, yeah, why every four minutes? Um, well, first of all, maybe why, why that often? Because um, in order to get the, um, the data on where bikes move and at what time, you need to have frequent um, data points that you collect. On the other side, why only every four minutes? That was because of the query time and the time it took to store the data in the database because the APIs were not, not all of them that nicely um, done that you could just do one API call and you would get all the, uh, all the data, but you had to do different weird for loops and, and everything to get all the data you wanted. So that took a little bit of time. So this is why we ended up with four minutes. 
And then, uh, of course, the final step is to, um, to put that into the database. So this is also what happens in the Python script, um, that it stores the data in the database. Uh, again, external, of course, you don't want to have that on your computer. And uh, in this case, we'll use the Amazon RDS, um, so relational database uh, for PostgreSQL. Um, yeah, and that about the general setup. Now I would like to go a little bit more into uh, a few details of the setup. Um, yeah, and also one last note uh, to that. Um, because of course it's a lot of data if you have thousands of bike locations and you query them every four minutes this produces a lot a lot of data um, but you want to dump everything into the database first and then worry about the cleaning later also for performance reasons so you just dump all the locations even though there will be a lot of duplicate data in there because if a bike um, doesn't move for an hour then of course it will send the same location over and over and over again um, but it is fa it's faster to just dump it into the database and then later look where are duplicates and I'll clean them then to do that before you write it into the database because then this Python script gets super slow. Um, all right, so um, first a note on what is a Chrome job for those of you who are not uh, familiar with that. Uh, Chrome is one of the most useful utilities you find in a Unix-like operating system. It is used to schedule commands at a specific time. These scheduled commands are tasks known as Chrome jobs. Um, yeah, about the definition. So how does it look like? You um, basically just have need one line. You have the command you want to execute. And um, with those five positions before that, you can tell how often should this command, um, shall this command be executed. So in our case, what we did, we had three different commands that we uh, ran frequently. Do you see the mouse? Sorry, point there. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, the first uh, script, the most important one, um, the one where we queried the bike APIs. Uh, like I said, we ran it every four minutes. So with um, yeah, this um, first um, position, you determine the minutes. Uh, but in our case, we didn't want to have it. Um, uh, at, um, uh, for example, um, eight uh, o'clock and four minutes, but every four minutes. So it's like this star and slash where you, um, how you tell that it's supposed to run every four minutes. Then we had a second script where we also queried the stations of next bike. So the um, stations where you can put your bikes into. And um, yeah, we queried those locations every day in case there were changes. Um, and uh, that ran every day at eight o'clock in the morning. So this is how it looks like it's eight in the morning. And then we had a cleaning script. So what I was talking about earlier with the database, um, we then, then set up a cleaning script that went through the database and looked at the duplicates. And if yes, then delete them. And we also had that uh, running once a day at um, yeah, 11 p.m. So this is how, yeah, basically the Chrome job looks like. So then, um, yeah, the most important part of automating um, the job is done. Uh, also, another topic I would like to get into because this was also something I wasn't really um, used to aware of um, before I started working with databases myself is um, yeah how do I uh, how do I work with the database because you I don't know have your AWS you have a nice um, tutorial on how to to set up your AWS but then you you also have to interact with your database um, which is on this external server. So uh, of course there is um, a way to do it programmatically where you can read and write into the database with the Python, Python script. So this is one extract of the Python script that I had on the Uber space where you first connect um, to, the, um, to the database. You have a um, host name and username and password, which is uh, what you will get from AWS in your, uh, in your console. You can find that and set that and then um, you connect to it and you have to write a little bit of SQL, but only like a short statement where it says um, insert into the table. And then you can insert your values there and close the connection again. So it's basically pretty simple and not a lot of SQL um, that you need to know. And um, yeah, there are also pretty good uh, tutorials and uh, blog posts about that if you want to uh, set that up, how to get that started. And uh, yeah, next to the programmatic way with Python, uh, there's also which I found pretty useful, 
um, a way to interact with the database with a UI. Uh, the Beaver is, for example, one um, free tool that I like to use um, where you can just um, yeah, link to your external database uh, in that UI. And then you would, for example, like you can see here on the right side, get a table view of your data. Um, and yeah, that makes it a little bit easier if you're not that familiar with SQL um, to have an easier interaction with, uh, with the data, database and also get a first look at the tables that you have in the database and um, what data is in there. Yeah, to, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the end, uh, I would like to give a few learnings um, to you that I learned uh, during that setup, uh, that uh, project. Um, so a few watch outs. Um, first, uh, be sure to include checks if your query runs properly. Because if you have your, um, like we had, if you have your setup and then you just put it on the server and then you say basically go and you don't look in it for the, uh, into it for the uh, next months, um, you don't realize if there's any error happening. So what we had, for example, with one of the um, APIs was that the APIs changed a little bit. So our query didn't uh, work anymore. So there are a few weeks where we don't have data for that uh, like, uh, provider. So what you should check is A, is the cron job work, uh, working properly? So is it actually really finding the file and executing the file? Or I don't know, was the file deleted or moved or something so the cron job doesn't really execute the proper file? Also, is the uh, data query properly? Uh, like I said, with the API that could be changing. And is the database up and running? Um, so a good way is to try to set up, uh, 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 set up yeah, email notifications that get sent to you uh, where it says, um, watch out, there is an error happening, maybe you want to look into that. Um, yeah, also uh, you should watch out for uh, with AWS because uh, AWS can really do a lot, uh, but it can also be very complicated. And usually there are uh, yeah, good tutorials uh, that help, um, but yeah, you should be sure to follow the instructions closely um, because I also had uh, some times where I look for hours for that one setting that I didn't set properly and that's why my, um, I couldn't connect to the database or something. But usually there are pretty good uh, yeah, help text by AWS. Um, well, I don't see the chat, I just see that somebody's writing in the chat. Uh, yeah, they, they were just sharing some more recommendations for um, database uh, tools. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Then also watch out for costs. Um, if you put the, the wrong settings, then AWS can also get expensive pretty quickly. So there's a, uh, the option to put a cost alert uh, to AWS, and I would uh, recommend doing that. Um, I also know of cases where you had within one month 500 or 600 uh, euro costs because there was just like the database set um, too large instead of the extra small or something by accident. Um, but AWS is usually also pretty friendly. So if you write a nice email that this was not on purpose, um, then usually you get your money back. But um, yeah, setting cost alerts is helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, that's it from this project. Thank you for your attention. And I think we're doing the Q&A later, right? Yeah, I think so. Let's um, everyone keep your questions in mind for Alex. And uh, yeah, Alex, thanks so much for this uh, talk. Um, it was really educational. Um, and you did a lot of groundwork for my talk later, so I'm very thankful that you explained Chrome jobs. <laughs> okay, then um, Yannick is up next. Uh, he cannot um, share, he cannot uh, turn on his camera because he is on his um, desktop PC, but uh, yeah. yeah he I, is hope you, I hope you can forgive me. <laughs> yeah, we can, I think. <laughs> okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Yannick. I'm um, from Stuttgart, uh, where I work as a data journalist and economics editor. And uh, I'm here to talk about um, automation and reporting that we're doing. Um, actually, Alex also laid um, groundwork for my presentation too. Um, and uh, I'm today, I'm not talking about um, 
economic stuff, but about uh, weather reporting that we're doing. Um, oops. So um, we we were uh, we had a challenge um, that was um, that uh, real time weather reporting was becoming more important for us um, due to global heating, uh, especially regarding um, the the very dry summers and uh, springs that we've been experiencing. Um, so our readers um, had um, like were, were quite interested in that um, topic. So um, we thought about automating um, that kind of reporting. And when I'm saying weather reporting, I'm not talking about um, uh, like a forecast, but about like actual um, uh, weather that's uh, going on right now. So um, we wanted to have um, reliable and frequently updated weather data. That was the first thing. Second, um, we needed a tool for interactive graphics that is able to um, to being updated constantly. And uh, third, a tool for automation. So I'm uh, going to start with uh, showing uh, an example. So can you still see my screen? Okay, so um, there was an article that we did um, in the summer. And uh, here you can see um, that we, we have a table um, uh, that displays um, the, the temperature uh, in all uh, parts of Baden-Württemberg um, in that case. And it's uh, updated constantly, actually it should be, yeah. So the, the, the time lags, lags uh, a bit behind due to the whole process that I'll show you um, right now. But um, we did four different things. Um, we were um, displaying uh, the driest place kind of um, just now. I, I can show you that too. Um, it's basically a table um, that shows you um, the place where uh, the longest time where the longest time passed since um, the last rainfall. So in that case, it's Stuttgart, where we didn't have uh, rain for 23 days, um, and uh, other places, um, yeah, did, didn't experience a lot of rain lately. And whoops, where do, where do I go back? Yeah. Uh, we did the same thing for for temperature as I sh just showed you for wind that might get interesting uh, in autumn and uh, same thing also for the highest precipitation or rainfall recently so <clears throat> oops, um, what's the pipeline the technical pipeline um, we also have uh, AWS working we have uh, R and R studio server working um, it's basically um, an R script that gets the data, processes them, and sends them to the to the tables or the charts. Um, and it's also like uh, Alex just showed you, um, automated using a cron job on Amazon Web Server. And I'm going to show you that uh, in a minute. First, I'm going to introduce the packages that I that I use uh, to do that. So there's first a very very great um, package called RDVD, um, which uh, allows you to access uh, the German Weather Services open data portal from, from R. It's really simple. Um, it basically needs only two functions. First, specify um, the, the stations, the, the measuring stations um, that you want to query in the first step. Uh, there you can also specify the time interval. So right now I'm querying the 10 minutes interval, which is like really, uh, really tight. Uh, I'm querying the air temperature. Um, and in a second step, um, the, the second function downloads um, the data. I'm gonna show you how that looks like too. Uh, that's the, whoops. Whoa, sorry. Here, that's uh, that's how the. Yannick, the, Yannick, the, I think you yeah. unshared your screen by accident. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Okay, can, I... can you share again? Yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> there you go. Is it working? Yes. Okay, sorry. So that's how the, the German Weather Services Open Data Port looks like, and that's basically um, these, these zip files are all zip files for all weather stations in Germany. And um, the function uh, in RDVD just downloads them and um, yeah, puts them in a nice data frame um, to work with. Um, the second um, most important tool I would say is Data Wrapper. Data Wrapper is a, a free tool from Germany uh, where you can visualize all sorts of data. So um, the, the table I showed you is probably the most basic thing. Um, you can have all types of, of charts. Um, you can have all types of maps. Even they, they provide you with the geospatial data too for, um, for the German Bundesländer, for example, for the German cities. It's everything is there. It's made for news outlets, um, but actually the free plan is very powerful and everyone can use it. You just need to um, make, a, make an account. Um, you can embed uh, the graphics, um, the charts via an iframe, for example. So um, it's, everything is interactive. And um, I'm going to show you a second example. Um, we use that for our coronavirus um, reporting too. So um, here, for example, you can see an interactive map uh, done in data wrapper. So you can you have even like a, a hovering menu. Um, you have uh, small multiples for uh, different cities. Like it's, it's really, really powerful. So I can really recommend you um, to look into it. And um, yeah, when you hover over it, it uh, shows you only like uh, these kind of lines. And um, the good thing why I'm talking about that after all is um, you can actually um, update your charts and change your charts from within R. So um, there's a second um, R package. It's called Data Wrapper. Um, it's, uh, it's been created by a data journalist from Süddeutsche Zeitung. And uh, it basically just accesses Data Wrapper's API. So you need an API key, but that's just provided from data wrapper um, uh, within your account. And um, for my purposes, I only need one, one line of code, which is DV data to chart. So you just provide an, um, a data frame and the chart ID. And also in the background, um, you provide um, your API key and um, it updates the data in your in your chart, in your in your map, whatever. And there's also other functions like for creating charts, for creating maps, for um, editing charts, for exporting charts. So um, it's also very powerful. And together, I use these um, these two packages um, on Amazon uh, Web Services. Um, you can install R and R Studio server. On there, it's um, it's also a bit complicated. I have to say, um, there's a there's a link to a tutorial I provide down there, um, where th that's the one I follow too. So um, should work. Um, I have an EC2 instance. It's the second smallest one, I think, and um, yeah, it suits my purposes. Um, and the first year is for free, actually. That's quite nice. And uh, right now. It costs me twelve dollars per month. So <clears throat> before I I show you the the live instant thing, um, I'm gonna be more precise on my pipeline. So um, I set up the instance with RNR Studio Server. I provided a list with the station IDs that are interesting for me uh, in an Excel file that I uploaded to the instance. I wrote an R script um, that downloads and processes the data, sends them to the chart. Um, I programmed a cron job to run the scripts every 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, most important, um, I use a log file um, to trace errors. So in the end of the script, it just prints um, whether um, the update process was successful or not. 
and down here you can see the um, the command uh, that's used uh, in the instance and um, I'm going to show you how that looks like so um, I got a I got an um, and a URL and um, I can log into the instance and it basically looks like the R Studio IDE um, where I have my scripts. Um, this is uh, how the log file looks like, for example. So um, every 15 minutes, it just prints um, the updated uh, URL to, um, to the respective chart. And um, I can also show you how the Chrome tab, Chrome jobs look like. This is basically the file. So right now I have uh, four um, automated files, three that are related to um, to the weather reporting. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically um, what I'm doing. I can quickly show you. Oops, where is it? Um, the data wrapper um, um, homepage too. So that's uh, how, what our account looks like. Um, in my case, it was uh, the easiest thing to just um, create the chart in data wrapper um, because here you can actually see how the table will look like later, like with the description and um, subtitles and stuff. And uh, once you get the, um, you get to the uh, ID of the chart, um, you can do everything from R. So um, the publishing, uh, like the updating and the publishing, um, all is done from from the from within R. And um, yeah, I'm providing the time so. Um, you can also see when the when the data were uh, updated last, and uh, I think that's about it from from my side. Cool, thanks so much. It was really interesting. And I already have some questions for later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, there was a lot of discussion already going on about data wrapper, so we can maybe uh, talk about that uh, later. I'm already seeing some uh, that we are not on the timeline, but um, well, we have a lot of um, extra time planned. So um, can everyone, did I share my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes, very good. I don't have such a nice uh, theme as uh, Yannick. I'm, I have to apologize. Yeah, so I will talk a bit uh, about like a personal uh, story from, um, what, what I learned at Correlate, but also at my job. So this is kind of a two part uh, story how I did the same thing, but uh, using um, different two different approaches over time. Um, yeah, so for that, uh, for the talk, we have to go back in time a bit uh, because that uh, actually we have to go back to 2017 because that's when I developed this um, script. And um, that's when this was also running in production. It was it was in production until 2018, I think, and then uh, somehow we shut it down uh, because we, I think we changed the website and then it was not part of our website anymore. So we are going a bit time traveling. So first of all, that's me, 2017. Uh, of course, short hair and uh, FC Köln fan. As you can see, it was the year where FC Köln um, got into Europa League, so that was um, the last match of the season. And uh, yeah, I was also about to write, um, to uh, write, start writing my master thesis. And um, so I had a lot of time because of that, because I was already procrastinating my thesis. And uh, I also got injured, How, um, as you can see here, I had this weird cast. So I was injured in summer in Constance, um, which is not a good combination because in, con in summer in Constance, you are supposed to go swimming. I was supposed to be outside, so I had a lot of time. Um, skills wise, I was quite good in R, um, I would say. I also had um, some experience with Linux from my personal computer and I had some Python skills, um, but not very good. 
um, but I had no experience whatsoever with, with the cloud. So I did not know who is a VM and what is even a server. I, I don't think I had the concept of that. Um, yeah. So I uh, also had purchased a Raspberry Pi to practice um, more of my Linux uh, programming. In uh, 2017, the Correlate infrastructure was also a bit different. Uh, so we did not have as much money as we do have now. So we could not purchase things um, as uh, liberal, as freely as we can do now. We did not have money to servers and uh, no SQL databases. So nowadays we have money to as our main provider and um, where we host our website and we also have MySQL databases there. Um, but we did not have that back then. We also had no Azure for nonprofits, so we could not just spin up a virtual machine, um, even though I wouldn't have known how to do that anyway. And uh, yeah, we did have like our website, it was still running on PHP back then, I think. Um, and we had, of course, our MailChimp newsletter. So this is why um, when I got this Raspberry Pi, it was also kind of like a good addition to the Correlate infrastructure uh, because we did not have a server somewhere where we could freely implement things. Um, yeah, so we had this web space, but uh, we could not do anything with it. So the Raspberry Pi is like a very small computer for those of you who don't know. It costs uh, 60 euros with um, everything included. And it has, this model has one gigabyte of RAM. So that's kind of, I think, comparable to like a smartphone from three years, two or three years ago, I would say, like a very uh, middle-class smartphone. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do with uh, this Raspberry Pi was I wanted to automatically collect correlate data. And the goal was to track and display the growth of our network and the relevant social media channels. So Facebook and Twitter in this case. So this was kind of the end product. I, um, it probably didn't look exactly like this. I just uh, coded that uh, today. Um, but yeah, this is obviously also the old, very old data as you can see. Nowadays we have over um, 2000 Twitter followers and over 1,400 uh, newsletter subscribers. So yeah, but this was kind of the end goal. So I needed to get all those data. And um, the thing is, I think with the Facebook API, you can get historical data. You can also um, calculate that from the data from MailChimp because you have the sign up date for each, um, for each person, but you cannot do that for Twitter with the API. You cannot get historical uh, follow accounts. So we had to also have, have like a process like Alex did um, and uh, also um, Yannick where we would uh, look at the data each day and store it somewhere to get the historical data. So the first version um, I did on my Raspberry Pi as I already said. So um, how did that look like? So uh, here I have the Raspberry Pi in this box and um, it was running an R script. And the R script was getting uh, data from Facebook API, from the Twitter API, and from Mailchimp, which was, um, yeah, it does not have like a proper, very good API. Um, but yeah, it was uh, not difficult um, to, to program that. And yeah, I did, then I did some pre processing in R and then wrote, it, um, wrote the data to two uh, databases, quote unquote. First of all, to a MongoDB hosted on something called mlab.com. That was something that I somehow um, was using back then. I think it got introduced to me during my studies. So that was something that we used um, in a course, I think. And so I was already familiar with that. Um, but of course, like a <laughs> regular database would have worked probably even better. And then I wrote also like a JSON file of the data um, to our FTP server. FTP server is um, just a file server uh, where you can store files. So um, that was where the website would then get the data from to display like the nice graph. The graph was actually not made in R, it was made in JavaScript. So um, yeah, we just used the data in JSON. 
So um, this is like what kind of files we had for that setup. So here's this R script that I mentioned, um, and this is kind of the upload script. And then there are some additional files. Um, yeah. And uh, you can check out the version of the code by going to this link here. Um, I, I also open sourced it uh, today. Yeah, and then something happened. Uh, I started working in December 2017. I started working at Cocentric, which is an IT consulting company. So um, I, in the first half, um, first year, half of the year 2018, I learned a lot. And that led me to um, change this whole approach and to implement something on AWS. So um, the second version of this whole uh, setup was then um, already looking a lot different. As you can see, if you compare, um, we don't have the data anymore. We don't have um, bash scripts uh, except for those two. And we, we switched, I switched to Python. And uh, this is also the current version, which is uploaded here. Um, but yeah, it's not running anymore. So don't um, try this at home, I would say. Probably won't work. Um, so, uh, what did I use for that? Um, I used AWS Lambda, which is, there's a lot of text I will explain. Um, it's an event-driven serverless computing platform. So, event-driven means that it only runs uh, responding to an event. So, um, it does not run constantly like a server or an um, EC2 instance, for example. It only runs if it's triggered by something. And interestingly, uh, this event uh, can also be a cron job. So I can configure an event that can run every day, every 10 seconds or something else. It's also serverless, which means that the underlying servers are automatically started and stopped by AWS. So I don't have to take care of that anymore. So it's in the cloud. So my Raspberry Pi is not necessary anymore. It was also, um, it's also uh, targets um, or is supposed to make it easy to um, develop smaller on demand applications. And those applications are called functions. And the function can literally be just a hello world function. So um, in Python, it would actually be a function. Um, yeah. And it's also very cheap even cheaper than um, EC2 instances if you only use, like very, if you don't call it very often. <laughs> so um, how does it look? Um, so I wrote the code in two Python files. Um, there's a lot of function in functions, uh, Python functions in, in those files, but in each file, I have only one main executing function. In the daily file, which is supposed to be running daily, I have get correlate data, and then in the other one, I have upload to FTP as the main function. And then I can uh, I use something else, which is called serverless, um, which is a very good framework, uh, which allows you to define those Lambda functions in a YAML file. YAML is a very horrific uh, standard. Uh, I don't like it so much, but it's, um, yeah, it's kind of what they use. So it makes um, defining those functions for AWS very easy and also the deployment. So <coughs> this is like uh, one snippet of this um, YAML file. So we define two functions, so two small applications. One is um, called daily correlate analytics and uh, the handler function, so the function that is supposed to be executed is called daily get correlate data. So we can see that is um, here this um, function from this file. And uh, equivalently, we have um, from the every Monday pie, we have upload to FTP file. And then we also define the events that will trigger those functions. <laughs> and so we can, as I said, we can also use prone jobs for that. And uh, that's what I did. So the daily um, uh, file or the daily function is um, executed every day at uh, around like 11 o'clock in the after in the evening and the weekly um, weekly function is uh, executed every Tuesday at like um, five minutes past midnight so basically every Monday you can still say 
And then uh, the deployment, um, how we get this from our computer to the cloud. Um, this is this little um, shell script. And then this command here is everything that you need to execute basically. And uh, what this will do, the serverless command, it will look at the YAML file and um, package everything up. So it will take the Python file, it will install the um, Python packages that you need and put it all in like, I think like a tar or something in a zip file basically. And um, it will then upload it to AWS and will also configure all the resources, all the resources that are needed on AWS. So the Lambda functions, but also some other things. So this is how it looks like um, in the updated version, or it looked like, it's not uh, up anymore. So we basically replaced the Raspberry Pi with the Lambda function and Python instead of R. And uh, the other things stayed the same, uh, other than that we also have had uh, back then, we had a MySQL database on money to by 2018. So what's the, the takeaway um, from, from, my, from this talk, I think? Um, so Raspberry Pis are really cool um, because they are like mini servers. You can t uh, play around with them. You can uh, let them plugged in in your um, uh, flat. And um, yeah, they don't uh, take up a lot of um, uh, strom, a lot of uh, electricity. But the cloud is cool as well. And uh, we can take advantage of that. And also from my personal perspective, you can learn a lot in a year, given that you, are, yet that you have the time and you're, of course you have the right opportunities um, to learn a lot, uh, as I did at my job back then. And yeah, the code is at this GitHub repository, um, but please don't use that. Uh, I put a big warning in the readme. Yeah, so I think, that's it. We are now. Oh, we only have ten minutes for the Q and A. Um, so let's let me stop sharing my screen. And um, okay, let's see in the um, chat. Okay, uh, what? Which image? Um, okay, maybe we start with Alex. Um, anyone has? Um, Anyone, any questions for Alex? Um, I don't remember actually. Uh, okay, maybe that your talk was just too good, Alex. <laughs> but I, I actually have a question uh, for Yannick. Yannick, how does it work? How does the data get from the R Studio server to the data wrapper? That was not very clear. Ah, it's the, the <coughs> it's the data wrapper package that does the job. So it's ah, okay. uh, it's uh, it's like an AP wrapper mm -hmm. where you just provide a data frame and um, and the the ID of the chart mm -hmm. and it just gets updated. So ah, okay. you 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 don't have uh, you don't need to do anything. Okay, so it's very handy yeah. and it's used a lot, um, not only in our case, but also at other news outlets for the coronavirus numbers. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that, make, that's, that, that makes sense. I, I probably just forgot that. <laughs> okay, there was so many, so much um, talk about data wrapper in the chat. Um, yeah, uh, I, I can. Hope you, I, uh, yeah. Do you want I can to say, I can say, yeah, I can say a word like yeah, you've been, you've been saying that of course data wrapper is, um, is made for uh, easy use. So, um, you don't need to code. You can, um, just click, um, and, uh, uh, put together your, your charts and maps and everything. Uh, in our case, it's just very handy, um, to use it from, uh, from within R, uh, because, that way you can automate it. There's also mm -hmm. a second way of automating um, data wrapper charts. I think you can uh, you can connect your own server to data wrapper charts, and mm -hmm. you can connect Google Sheets to your um, 
Oh, that might also be very interesting. Two years. So in the beginning, I was thinking of um, first filling a Google sheet and then connecting that to data wrapper, but mm. then I discovered the data wrapper package and that's just way easier. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. asked uh, earlier about that, what um, the advant advantage of data wrapper um, compared to Plotly. Um, I don't know, I haven't worked for the data wrapper in R. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, that's one advantage, like the interface of data wrapper is in the browser on the UI. Um, but yeah, maybe you can tell a little bit more about that, Yannick. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, I, I, I guess I haven't worked with Plotly um, a lot too, but um, I think it's just way easier to, um, to implement it in uh, in your web web page at least in our case we can um, we you, you get the iframe in the end of um, of your of your creation process of the chart and you just um, put it into your HTML file and um, it gets updated constantly so um, I don't know how that would work with plotly to be honest and if that's possible I just I think I once heard that it's not that easy to um, to implement your um, plotly graphics in, in an HTML but I'm, I'm not sure I haven't tried mm -hmm. it okay um, then we have uh, Liam has raised his hand so I will unmute him now or you, you are just unmute yourself, I think um, that's easier. Uh, there yeah. we go. Alex, I had a, a question for you. Thanks for the talk. Um, you, you made a comment at the end that you want, uh, you know, some alert if something goes wrong in your cron job and that you could send an email. Is there a easy method that you would use to, to send yourself emails automatically when, when something fails? Um, it kind of depends on what fails. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, like I said, I didn't really do checks. So, um, <laughs> that uh, would, would have been something I should, should do. Um, there's one way, of course, where you can, for example, if, um, the, the Python script itself runs perfectly fine, then, um, I guess the Chrome job cannot really throw an error. Then you have to just code that into your Python script where you make a check I don't know the, that the API is returning an error or an empty data frame or whatever, um, and then just send an email through the Python code. Um, Chrome job itself can send emails. I don't know, at least at Uberspace, they did also send emails automatically if the Chrome job failed. So there I didn't have to set that up myself. I'm not sure if that's how the default is. Um, uh, yeah, and then of course, if I don't know the AWS, um, something is not working there, um, there might be the other things you need to watch out. So it's kind of, you need to look what could possibly fail and then at what part of your process do you have to uh, identify that. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, thumbs up from Liam. Uh, Henry also raised his hand or was your question answered in the chat by now? Henry, you have to unmute yourself if you want to speak. Yes. Now we should hear you. Hi. I didn't check the chat now, but um, so my question was I'm only from back from, I mean, you, I know that you cannot just um, dump websites uh, on your server automatically. Is there something uh, similar with APIs, with open APIs that you sometimes have a tag? You can query me, but you're not allowed to store something. I mean, uh, yeah, that also, um, yeah, I guess, depends on the API. And um, th this was also a little gray area topic, I guess, uh, on that project. Um, I mean, there are some APIs that clearly say um, you can use the, uh, the data freely. I also once worked with one API where they um, stated in their um, RGBs um, that uh, you, uh, you have to delete the data after 24 hours. And then um, there are APIs, so for example, Mobike, the data that we queried there was not actually supposed to be an API that you use from the outside, but it was just like their internal API that they used to send to their own app. And um, they were just people who kind of um, backwards engineered that app and kind of got the API link, um, which we used. So um, I guess that, for example, was data that wasn't really um, 
there to be used to the open. So it was always a little tricky question, what's allowed, what is not. And I guess um, the best way would probably to just ask um, the provider if it's not said clearly. Um, with the shared bike data, um, because I also started looking into it and ask um, different different people and there I kind of got the feedback, well, actually everyone is querying those data, this data and, um, and storing it. So mm. um, nobody really, really cares because also the, the providers know that their data is being stored and um, okay. if you as well, then nobody will, will care about you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, not an easy topic. Uh, Liam, is your hand still raised or is it again raised? Uh, no, sorry. I, I didn't okay. realize I have to unraise it. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, Henry, was your question answered? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. We, had, we had one uh, question which was a bit more general, which I found really interesting, which was from Daniel. I don't know. I can maybe read it out. I got increasingly confused at the amount of different platforms and tools people used. What is the concrete benefit of distributing work among a shit ton of different tools? Is it for cost saving reasons or performance reason, reasons also? Is, is it that daunting as it looks to me or is it a piece of pie once you got familiar to the tools? Also, isn't just a complex setup more prone to errors? Um, yeah, um, I think, I don't know, what, what do you guys uh, think, uh, Alex and um, Yannick? I, I didn't find it too complicated and I also don't think, I mean, you, you're maybe prone to more errors, but if you, um, if you implement um, uh, mechanisms that, that raise the problems, um, you, can, you can solve them quickly, I think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think and also, yeah. No, I, I, in, in my case, I think there's just not the tool the one tool that does everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, in in the case of what I did with the data collection, um, I think there are tools that can do this. I think maybe Tableau could do that. Um, I think, uh, I, of course, it's complex, it, um, and it's not not as uh, convenient as to just run something from your own laptop. And it's very daunting at first. I think when I started doing that, I was like, "Very, what am I doing? This is kind of uh, magic, like magic on, on some some Raspberry Pi even, right? Because it's not as visible as if you run something interactively. But yeah, I, I personally, I, I think I grew with my tasks, as you would say in German. Um, so it, it, at the beginning, it was very complex and then it got a bit less complex and I learned, I realized some things along the way. And of course, those diagrams, um, they looked like there were a lot of tools, but um, uh, I think if, yeah, those tools are always, yeah, it's a learning process. Once you realize like you have, they have certain roles like um, so one tool is supposed to store data, one tool is supposed to get data, um, then it's, it's, yeah, to see the big picture takes a while and to understand like the mechanics, but it gets less complex over time. But yeah, of course we heard that um, proper error logging is very important, otherwise we, um, yeah. And I think it's also just a question of what you're used to. So I well, I already had like the UDA space, so that's why I put the script there. And then I was like, oh shit, now I need the database. And then I just used AWS. And yeah. I also yeah. put the script in the beginning on AWS and only used AWS. But it was more of a, I already had the UDA space and was used to using that. Yeah, that's also a reason, right? Yeah, and it's, uh, some, it's probably m most of the time, at least I find that it's cheaper too distribute things across like for free tools than to buy something that those all in solutions often cost money um, yeah that I could not spend. Lisa wanted to say something. Lisa. Yeah hi um, I just wanted to participate in the um, multi-tool uh, discussion because uh, for, for me it's also very um, interesting to see at the beginning of a project when you depending on who you work with you have to you always have to think about what tools are we going to use and uh, i feel like sometimes 
people don't think about this. They just start with something that they already know. And then in the end, it turns out someone else cannot use it. And then you have to switch in the middle of the project. So I, um, I feel like there are, there, are, there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. And then first, uh, I have also spent a lot of time at, at like getting to know what is all out there and what could I use. Um, so I'm feeling with the person <laughs> who has asked the question. Yeah, yeah, there are like always 200 uh, ways to achieve one thing. Yeah, that's that's very true. And it's so so fast, everything develops so fast, right? So the setup that I had is probably now not up to date anymore anyway. So, okay, we are already over time. So um, I just once again want to share my screen quickly because um, of course important that um, I uh, thank you for coming. But uh, yeah, if you're not subscribed already, uh, please make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. And um, yeah, please uh, give us some feedback over at SurveyMonkey, which is really important because we also have to write uh, boring reports to, um, to, uh, to our, or we have to apply for grants and then it's always good to have some data to back up how um, how we are working and what kind of events we are doing and what so the feedback, feedback is. Okay, very good. Um, thank you all for coming. See you. Bye.